little bit. So, Acts uh, chapter 15. <clears throat> and while my laptop comes out of sleep mode, I will uh, ask a question. One thing that I really appreciate about our church uh, is that it's so multicultural and that you know we have such a diversity of, of, of people and diversity of nationalities, of languages, of uh, races, of uh, what other things, uh, you know, what, what kinds of other things, age, education, uh, education vocation, and we can, we can go on and on and on. The interesting thing about these things that, that we look at as humans, and we, we tend to put people in boxes, it's so in our nature, we're so conditioned with it, and, and it's the world that we grow up in. Uh, sometimes even limits us by, by these differences. Um, in what way do you think you've been limited by, by any of these things in, in your past or present? Or by any of these things that the world classify people by? All these boxes that the world people put in? Different countries, maybe. Different countries? How does that limit us? Religion, speak, languages, cultures. Yeah, it limits us. You go to a different country, you're like, oh, I can't understand them and they don't understand me. Well, I have one girl who speaks 15 different languages and she's very clever. Well, she, still, yeah. she gets, because if she you go to India, Laos, there's three different dialects in India, three different dialects. If you go to Laos in Thailand, it's different. If you go yeah. to different countries, even in England, you can talk Welsh, you can talk Gaelic, you can talk Scottish, even... Yeah, languages can be limited. Yeah. <laughs> it can be very <laughs> difficult. Yes, and yes. I have one person who speaks 15 different right. languages. I'm, I'm yeah. thinking of growing up as a South African, mm. and, you know, not... Um, instituting or not starting anti-apartheid anti or apartheid, but being part of it, and how limited it was, and how difficult it was at stay, you know, at some stages in my life. So yeah. I think that's a, a good example, personally. Yeah, even now, it's the other way around in South Africa, where as a white person, <coughs> you know, there's affirmative action and quotas, and, and uh, if you want to go and study medicine and you're white, there's only 10% of medical students are allowed to be white. Uh, yeah. So it's sort of in reverse now. It's, uh, um, if you want to go to some countries, they say, no, you can't come, you need a visa. <laughs> <laughs> or if you go to North Korea, they say, no, you can't come, not even if you have a visa. <laughs> so in all, all kinds of ways, the world we live in likes to make differences and, 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 and uh, distinguish in all kinds of different ways. When, uh, when I was in Amsterdam, the organization that Liesl worked at, um, the Royal Tropical Institute, uh, it's an international organization, and one of their divisions deal with, uh, uh, they call it intercultural professionals. And what they do is they, they work with companies and organizations to, to train them with uh, intercultural communication mm -hmm. and intercultural cultural work. Uh, so, for example, if a large multinational company send their staff overseas, they would give them some training. Mm. And uh, so I got involved in that and I would, uh, I would do a one day or a two day workshop on help training people how to, to deal with going to a completely different culture. And there's sort of a generic module to it and then one part of it is country specific. And I said, well now, when you go to South Africa, this is what <laughs> you'll find is different. Mm. Um, and how do you deal with that? So like, for example, time is different in South Africa. If, uh, in, in England, if you say, I'll see you soon, mm -hmm. how soon do you, would you reckon that would be? Never. <laughs> <laughs> tomorrow. So tomorrow. <laughs> Half an hour. Depends on the context, depends on the same day, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I'll see you now in, in um, England, what would that mean? Yeah. Now, yeah. now, like within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, an hour, an hour? Yeah. Yeah. Right, now. right now, yeah, but yeah. not more than 15 minutes, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So in Africa, in, in Africa, if you say, I'll see you now, <laughs> they might yeah. have left. Well, <laughs> well, it means, well, hopefully before the sun sets, <laughs> tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah. 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 So, right. when we lived in Namibia, you know, there's a saying uh, in, in, 
in, in the West, there's a saying that says, don't put off until tomorrow what you can do yeah. today. Yeah. So in Namibia, we used to say, don't put off until tomorrow what you can put off until next week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and, and sometimes we find these things funny, and sometimes we find them irritating, and sometimes it's so deeply rooted within us that we think it's a matter of right and wrong. It's like, mm. no, no, that's wrong. It shouldn't be like that. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because it's so ingrained in us. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it can be something, you know, can be something completely misunderstood sometimes as well. Just because of culture and language. Like, if I, in England, if I say, oh, the turkey is ready to eat. What would that mean for, mean to you? Come to the table. Come to the table. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The dinner is ready. And if in England I say, "Oh, the dog is ready to eat." What? Yeah, but in England you'd say, "Oh, Not interesting." <laughs> the dog's hungry. He wants to eat. Mm. If I go to Asia <laughs> and I say, "The dog is ready to eat," what will that mean? <laughs> Something completely different now. It's like, an, oh, we're going to have the dog now. <laughs> Dinner is ready. Sorry, I'm sorry. But it's interesting how these differences can sometimes become so important to us that, that we, it can upset us and it can bring us even into dispute. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to look at today as we, uh, as we turn to Acts 15. And I think one thing that's helpful to understand before we read this is that we, we read a bit here about two cities, Antioch and Jerusalem. Uh, now, what, what do we know about, does anybody know about Antioch and Jerusalem? What do we know about these two cities? Anybody know? What do we know about Jerusalem? I know about Antioch, the disciples were, or the Christians were called disciples first in Antioch. Right, yes, that happened in Antioch, yeah. It's, uh, that's where they were called Christians first. They were called disciples before that. And, yeah, what else do we know? Where, where are these two cities? Where's Jerusalem? It's in Israel, yeah. So, I mean, Jerusalem is where the temple is. It's a very, very much the heart, the holy city, the heart of Judaism. It's the heart of the, of the Israelite kingdom. And Antioch is in Syria, modern-day Syria. <coughs> uh, and today it's, it's a Muslim country, but in the time of the Bible, Antioch was very much a pagan city. It mm. was filled with Gentiles. Mm. So two very different cultures, two very different nations. Mm. And that's helpful to understand that when, when we read this. So if we go to Acts 15, and we start reading here, so just to give the context, Acts 14 was the end of Paul's first missionary journey. And uh, we went through a few chapters how we went, uh, he did that big circle, the tour, he went to the island, and then through Asia Minor, did his circle route, and then came back to Antioch. And this is where he comes. So Paul is back in Antioch, mm -hmm. he's teaching the church there, and this is where we pick up the story. So in uh, Acts 15 verse 1, the certain people came down from Judea to Antioch, so from Jerusalem basically, or from that area around Jerusalem, <coughs> And they were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Okay, let's just pause there for a moment. So what happened here? Why, why was this, there this big dispute going on suddenly in the church? What was the big argument about? It was salvation. It was about salvation. How to be saved. Yes, how to be saved. Is this an important issue? Well, yes. Yes. It's very much important. <laughs> sure. What if these people came from Judea and they said, look, you need to wear white robes in church because that's the right way to do it. Mm, that's what cultural That would have been a cultural thing. <laughs> what if they said you have to wear white robes to be saved? Mm. Oh. Yeah. You still wouldn't know. That's yeah. a different thing. Mm. Mm. So 
this became a very big issue, not only because of the fact that they, they said, oh, you know, according to the custom taught by Moses, but because they made this a salvation issue. Mm -hmm. And you know, the question is, what is worth disputing about, even for us as Christians? You know, there's, there's a lot of division in, in churches even nowadays. Yeah. Walk around London and now you can find how many churches, how many different churches, and, and they all differ in some way or another. Mm. Um, what are some of the things that distinguish churches today? That you'll say, oh, this church is the, like this, and this church yeah. is like that. That makes speaking them different. Speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues, yeah, that's one thing. Mm. So some would say, oh, we speak in tongues, and others say, we don't. Infant yeah. baptism. Infant baptism. Some say, oh, you, we christen babies, we baptize babies, some say, no, we get baptized as an adult. Yeah. Well, those processions with even young kids, they are trained for con confession, con something, con confirmation, like for confirmation, yeah, confirmation, some yeah. have confirmation when you reach your teenage years and some don't. Yeah. Uh, what else? Different practices. Different practices around baptism. Yeah. Uh, Pardon? Papalship or, you know, um, the leadership. You know. The leader? Oh, that's yeah. a bit, yeah. Some say, no, the Pope is the leader of the church and some don't acknowledge the Pope. They say, no, we have local leadership. <laughs> so the Presbyterian church was came out of that. They said, no, we are we are led by elders. Presbyter is the, the Greek in the Bible for elder. Mm. So we are less led by elders and not by the Pope. Different views on leadership. marriages and divorces. Sure. Mm. Marriage yeah. and divorce, yes. Yeah. Are you allowed to divorce in yeah. the church? Are you allowed to remarry mm. if you've been divorced? Mm. Yeah. Um, are you allowed to marry somewhere outside? Yeah. 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 Roles, yeah. so same Roles yeah. yes. Are, are mm. women allowed to speak mm. in the church or not? Are they allowed to, yeah. uh, to preach? Like or not? Things like that. Head covers, mm -hmm. yeah, all, all kinds of things mm -hmm. that True. that singing. that singing, yeah, singing. Worship. 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 <laughs> instruments or no instruments. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, when Lisa and I started dating, we both from Protestant uh, Calvinist churches. The church that she was in and the church that I was in before our time, about 50 years before us, <laughs> was one church and then they split yeah. Uh, yeah. because of about five, four or five reasons. But one of them was that uh, our church adopted small cups for communion and their church said, no, 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 we must have one cup that everybody shares and gets yeah. passed around. Okay. So. Did Paul and Barnabas, so what happened in the church here is this, this teaching came in and they became into this dispute. Would the easiest solution not just have been to say, okay guys, let's just split them. Mm -hmm. Why don't you guys, we'll make two churches. We'll make the circumcision church and the not circumcision church. Isn't that the easiest solution? No, no. Not in that case. Not in that case. No. Wouldn't that, that have been easier? I'm not asking is that the correct solution, <coughs> but would it have been no, the easiest solution? It would have been easier. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it would have been easier. Why do you disagree, Sarah? Uh, well, because, because I know Paul, because I'm sure he, he was reminded how he was saved in that encounter with Jesus. He was saying, never. <laughs> There's no salvation what you talk about. Yes. I yeah. would say. On the right ground. Okay, I see what you So for Paul, it would not have been easy. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I also. It's hadn't happened before in the church. It's, it's one of those things when it first happens, it becomes easier. Right. The first time. Oh, that's a good point. Yes. Yeah. It's, you know, yeah. it's, it's like um, it's like it's like the solution is to sister about divorce. If you know somebody who's divorced, you're more likely to get divorced yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 almost it's almost like a contagion. Mm. Like so, oh, that's a, that is a very good point. Yeah. That, this could have led to the first split in the church, and, and so. It may have been a solution to say, let's just go our own separate ways, and, and, and there was definitely a possibility and a threat at the mm. time, but mm. what they did is they said, no, we, we need to, we can't just separate, this is not, we can't just take the easy way out. Cool. Yeah. How, how, how would we apply this to our own, just personal lives today? Um, have you ever had conflict with anybody? Yeah. Oh, you don't have to answer yeah. that as a public, but I appreciate your, uh, your openness. See, I've got gay friends <coughs> and lesbian friends, and some churches won't accept it. I've actually got a gay friend who's a priest. Right. 
Yeah, he, so that's another My brother advantage. is actually married to a doctor. Right. He's gay. Right. So that's another one of those. It's very embarrassing for some people. Right. My own family will argue over this. Right. Mm -hmm. Very hard. I have gay friends, I've worked with I've got a friend who will not even work with them. You can't even work with them. He won't even talk to them. Right. This yeah. is very embarrassing. Yeah. Because he's a good friend of mine. Right. So but he will not work with them. It right. causes big problems. It causes big problems. So Churches, there's rows between gay marriages. Now, this country, we've accepted gay marriages. Yeah. Other countries, you will be stoned to death. In a Muslim country, you will be executed. Yeah, again, there's killed. huge, huge differences. They won't accept it in, places, so. in the Philippines. Yeah. So you can't even get a job if you're gay or lesbians. They won't right. accept it. This right. is wrong. Right. So in our personal lives, when, we, when we're faced with situations like this, when disputes and debates, <coughs> even for ourselves, we can say, well, what's the easy way out? It's not going to just go in our separate ways. Um, but what did Paul and Barnabas and the church do? They said, no, no, we can't just do that. We have to, we have to work through this. We have mm. to deal with this. We, mm. we have to wrestle with it. Uh, yeah. uh, we, we cannot just say, let's just walk away. And that's some of the harder, one of the hardest things with conflict is sometimes we just agree to disagree. It's like, oh, okay, fine. You know, you go your way. I'll go my way. You know, and, mm. and we never resolve the actual issue. We never work through it and, and deal with it and say, what, what we're actually trying to achieve here is, is unity. And so they said, no, we need to resolve this. Yeah. Because this is so foundational, especially this matter, was, which was about salvation, is that we, need, we do need to work this out because we don't want to break the unity of Christ, the unity of the body. Mm. So they resolved, they're going to send them <coughs> to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about this question. Um, so we carry on in verse 3. So the church sent them on their way as they traveled, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. Now, interesting, Phoenicia and Samaria are both also Gentile areas. Um, what did they not share, or at least it's not mentioned here? What did Paul and Barnabas, as they traveled through here, what did they not share as they traveled through these regions? What did they not tell them about? The dispute. The dispute, yeah. They keep quiet about it. They keep quiet about it. Mm. Which I think is a good lesson, you know, it's like, in, hang on, this is not going to be encouraging. Mm. <coughs> it's got nothing to do with them. Mm. What we can share with them is good news that will encourage them, that will, and, and it did. It made the believers very, very glad. Um, so, it's just an interesting little side note. So, it made all the believers very glad. We carry on in verse 4. It's, it's, it's interesting, that's right, it's interesting. Yeah. It's interesting that they didn't say so at the time, but obviously... We know about it, but it's in the Bible. Yes. So it's, it's, it's not like it's, I think, mean, it's quite, he's going to hate it. I don't think they hate it at all, you know about it, but it wasn't, it wasn't pulled over and, and focused on. Indeed, it wasn't so, focused yeah. on, yes. It wasn't like, this is the primary message. Oh, you know, we've got some, oh, yeah, you know, there's this mess going on in Antioch, and, yeah. like, you know, it's like in... No, it, it was in, we never know about it in the Bible. Indeed, so. yes. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a... Uh, <coughs> So in verse 4, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So again, they, they share good news as well. It's not only about, oh, you know, there's this issue. It's, it's, uh, it's always helpful to, to keep perspective and to, to not just focus on the, on, the, on the conflict and the negative issue and the, and the thing that is being disputed. So verse 5, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So in verse 6, the elders, uh, the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. So uh, how did they deal, start to deal with this, uh, this dispute? Well, they met with the leaders of the church to discuss right. it. Yeah. Right. Presumably in a calm way. So yeah, presumably. Well, we hope so, yes. It doesn't say so, but it also doesn't say that it didn't. It's, uh, well, he started off with the Jews first of all, though. Oh, the circumcision. 
they, there's a Jewish talk to other beliefs, and that's how it actually started. I, I was told it was actually taught by Jewish religion, the circumcised, and then it went on to all over different places. In the that's world. right, yeah, it was, it was Jewish. So for a Jew, to be a Jew, you have to be circumcised. Yeah. So, mm. so under the old covenant, before Christianity, yeah. mm. that was the sign of salvation, that you're part of God's people, his circumcision. Yeah. But with Christ, that mm. law was scrapped. Mm -hmm. The law of Moses was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus introduced baptism as the way of salvation rather than circumcision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the Jews, so this is where the cultural difference comes in. They, that's what they were raised with. That's what they were taught from them when they were little children. So it was very hard for them to, uh, uh, some, you know, from the outside we can look mm -hmm. at, the, at this and, and you know, it's so easy to judge someone else. Mm -hmm. It's like, can't they just get it? I mean, it's, isn't it so simple? You know, it's much mm -hmm. easier to just, you know, just get baptized. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to hang on to this old thing? The same with Jews. <coughs> when you die, you're born with no clothes on. And when you die as a Jew, they take all your clothes off and you're putting Bare a coffin buried with no clothes on. Well, and it okay. still goes on to this day. Okay. Yeah, so well, it's very commission. unusual. Mm -hmm. For us, it's unusual. And that's their Maybe. rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. I, had, yeah. I went to a Jewish, uh, same as a Jewish wedding. It's very weird. So they have their own beliefs and you cannot change them. Well, yeah, I wouldn't say it's kind cannot change it, but it, I think it's, oh, it's always helpful us to, for, for us to understand that sometimes we look at those things like, oh, how is it so hard to change? Like, oh, they're so stuck in their ways. Mm. But if we think about ourselves, do you have ways that we are stuck in, that we find hard to change? Or think like, yeah. oh, it's just the way, mm. yeah. Mm. Any thoughts? <laughs> Simon, is it, you want to share something? Or? <laughs> no, I was just thinking, I was even thinking this week how, you know, we're all kind of very quite stubborn, you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, we all like our things, don't we, and <laughs> sins and whatever, you know, and, and uh, you know, so, um, yeah, we, it, it's I was so liking it to, with Emma, actually, um, I just said it's like the old man who won't give, give up his old um, mattress, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no matter how disgusting it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so let's go back, like, when I was born, my parents were so strict, you know, even to this day, you can't change, like, anywhere I go, you take your shoes off. My, I, I hate it, I will not have any cigarettes in my house. I've never bought cigarettes in my house. I refuse, you know, my daughter-in-law smokes. I throw her out of the house. Right. She will, I cannot stand. There's, and I, it, like, now we've changed to like going into a pub. You can't smoke. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't gamble. I hate football, I hate, but I love martial arts. I like hurting people. But that's my job. Um, but it's weird, you, you cannot change, yeah. you know? It's weird, my age now, been brought up by my parents, right? The first thing you do when you go into anybody's house, you, it, to this day, you take your shoes off. And I can't stop it, you just automatically do it. Mm -hmm. And the people look at me and, you know, they say, Paul, you don't have to take your shoes off. It's just, I can't stop it. Yes, it's, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been brought into <coughs> me, right? And you cannot, like, put your shoes on. Right. It's right. something you just cannot change. Right. You know? Yeah, so it's, uh, and I think the interesting thing is yes, Alita. Well, I was uh, you know, just thinking of this, uh, of the scripture saying that when someone comes to Christ, they become a new creature. Yes. So to, <coughs> to me, it was to leave behind stuff. It wasn't easy, but mm -hmm. then I realized how easy it is to be new. Yes. And how easy you can move through things when you are flexible. So yes. you, you show, you show love actually to someone else if you give up on your ways. Yeah. Right. Make room for. Yeah. Oh really? Is that easy? Oh yeah. Oh it is. <laughs> so, to me, it was this process of peeling off, you know, yeah. peeling okay. off and then become. That's a very good point. Yeah. And what you're saying is, it's really interesting. I was listening to a radio program on the way home last night. And it was an interview with a Syrian refugee, mm. <laughs> a microbiologist in, her, you know, in Syria, but she, came here, she had nothing, she had absolutely nothing. And she, uh, and she actually began making award-winning cheeses mm. in Yorkshire. 
And, uh, and one of the things she said in the interview, she said, well, it's when you're, when you're in a brand new situation, everything is new, it's easy to become something new. It's easy, you know, it's been, because everything's possible. You know, right. the, everything, you've got nothing, uh, everything, everything you had was completely irrelevant, but now you're in a completely, you have to sort of swim for swim, but it means everything is possible. So it's like, you know, as you're saying, you've got something new, like when you become Christian, yeah. it, that, that's kind of, that's what we say, man. Very true. Yeah, yeah. 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 interesting. A good point. And so I think when you know when Jesus said, "If you want to come after me, anyone who wants to follow me must give up everything." And sometimes we think about, oh, it's physical things we need to give up, or or it's our sins we need to give up. But it's really our whole identity actually we need to give up. And saying, no, but I I am adopting a completely new identity, a new way of life, and. Yeah. And what seems impossible becomes possible. Mm -hmm. that, that change, that transformation that happens in the water of baptism is almost amazing. It's like, wow, you've changed so much. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't even know it. It was, uh, it was amazing for me. I, I worked at a, there was a company I worked at in South Africa before I became a Christian. Mm -hmm. and then I left the company, did some other work, became a Christian, and then I went back to that company. And two or three people there said, wow, you've really changed. I'm like, really, did I? One of them said, yeah, you used to be so arrogant. <laughs> I'm like, now you tell me. <laughs> you never told me that. <laughs> but, of course, in becoming a Christian, I realized how arrogant I was. I was like, oh, my goodness, I'm so prideful and arrogant. Wow. And it's encouraging to know that, to hear from others that, they saw that I, mm. that changed, yeah. but anyway. <laughs> I think the lesson, you know, what we see here is that it's so easy from outside the situation to cast a judgment on someone who struggles to change or someone who's who's stuck in a certain way. When we see it a different way, I'm like, why can't they just think like like I do? Mm. And, and one of the things I, I, I teach in that, in that course, in the intercultural communication, and we see it throughout the Bible, is, is that we need to start from a point of curiosity almost, to try and understand someone else, mm -hmm. and understand why they think why they do, uh, and put ourselves in their shoes before <coughs> we get into the dispute of right and wrong, and I'm right and you're wrong. And, um, yeah. And, and, and what I appreciate about the church in, in Jerusalem, they could easily have said they were all Jews. They were all raised yeah. in that society. Mm. And even they struggled with this. Pete, God had to appear to Peter in a vision mm. and show him this vision mm. of all the animals and tell him yeah. to eat. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> even after he became a Christian, he struggled yeah. with it. Mm. Even later, when Peter went to Antioch, uh, we read later on in, in, in Acts, we read it in, in Galatians, yeah. We read, Peter went to Antioch, and then Paul got into the spirit and said, Peter, you came to Antioch, and you went and you sat with the, with the Jews, and, and, and you wouldn't eat with the, with the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. It was hard for him. It was hard to, to even for him as, a, as an apostle in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Yet they met together, and they said, let's discuss this. Let's come up with a solution. How can we, how can we resolve this in a way that keeps the church together? So, uh, in verse 7, <clears throat> we read, after much discussion, okay, no quick conclusions, <laughs> much discussion, yeah. Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. Mm -hmm. So, that's when he went to, uh, to um, what's his name? Oh, so yeah, to the Gentiles. Cornelius. Uh, when he went to Cornelius. Yeah, Cornelius. Um, <clears throat> verse 8 God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. So Peter brings an interesting perspective. He reminds them that, hang on, this is a new deal. The gospel is 
different from what the law was, and we know that God has, has, uh, has made salvation available to all people now. He says, but hang on, you yourselves know that this law of Moses is a heavy burden to bear. Why do you want to now make it heavy for others as well? And he reminds them about the new covenant of grace and salvation through grace rather than through the law. Um, so then Paul of Barnabas speaks and everybody listens to them. And in verse 13, when they finished, James spoke up. James is another one of the apostles, one of the leaders. And then he says, brothers, he said to listen, me, listen to me. And we skip to verse 19. In verse 19, James concludes and with a proposed. So James says, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now, this is interesting. Even when we people, or when we think about our Christianity, do we think it's a difficult thing? Do we sometimes make it difficult? Do we sometimes make it difficult for ourselves? And in what way do we do that? Simply holding on our old stuff. Holding on to old stuff, yeah? Not being willing to say, oh, they will take an excuse or something. Not yeah. To... That's one way. Mm. Any other thoughts? I think we sometimes also maybe make it difficult for people by putting, putting restrictions or maybe traditions that we think they should do first. <coughs> that perhaps, like in this situation, are not salvation yeah. things, are just the way that we like to do things. Yes. We make it difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To people by saying that they have to do that first. Yeah. So it's, mm. yeah. Bring up examples. But yeah. You don't want to bring up examples, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you can probably all think of examples. Yeah. And, and, and some of them are borderline, and some yeah. of them are clear. But, yeah. Some of them are like, really? It's like, a, a, you know, so uh, I know in my early days as a Christian, there was no way anybody would be baptized if they hadn't been to church. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 they need and to come to church number, a certain number says, of times yeah. certain yeah. before you can baptize. No matter if they were an ER doctor even or a nurse. You can't even get married. You have to, you have to yeah. attend yeah. that church so many yeah. times yeah. before they'll marry you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, now, we can discuss the details a lot like they did do, they wrestle yeah. through it. Yeah. So, <coughs> I think it's important when you're sharing your faith with people not to share too much religion, you know, mm. and um, lots of um, kind of rules and everything mm. like that. It's not, yeah. I, I think that some of those, you know, obviously they're important, you know, but um, that's not the, it's not what Jesus is trying to do. Jesus wants to reach out to people, love them, you know, mm. and that's the most important. That's a very good point, and that's yeah. what James is trying to say. It's like, hang on, let's not miss the message of the grace mm. of God, which is the gospel, the good news, mm -hmm. by... Yeah. Making it hard for people, and oh, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, and only then. It's like, and then it's not grace anymore. Then it's not, you know, you miss, mm -hmm. we missed the whole point here. Mm -hmm. So he said, no, we, let's not make it difficult. So in verse 20, he makes a proposal. It's like, how can, how can, we, how can we solve this? So he said, well, okay, let's not even talk about this issue of circumcision. But he says in verse 20, instead, we should write to them, Telling them to abstain from food polluted to idol, by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Mm. Now we're going to have to dig a bit deeper here because this is quite interesting. Why do you think he switched from the issue of circumcision to saying, but hang on, let's tell them this? Well, I mean, when a bit earlier saying <coughs> that this is a, you know, that um, uh, back in verse 10, he says, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the next to the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our forefathers have been able to bear? So that was the sort of, they talked about the, the bigger issues around. You know, the, the, circ the circumcision is almost like a, a proxy about the bigger, yeah. you know, following the law and you know, what that means. Yeah. And that's obviously what they discussed. You know, it's like, well, how, you know, you know the, the law is not working, hasn't worked, yeah. it's been fulfilled. 
you know, what, what, what's, what is the kind of, the, what useful things can we give people to help them in their faith? Right. So that, that's, that's, a, that's how the discussion they had. Yeah, it's useful things to help them in their faith. Circumcision is a very clear dividing line. You either are or you're not. Yeah. <clears throat> These things are more like, in, well, oh well, yeah, the, you can abstain from them. Maybe you did it in the past, but now you don't do it anymore. And it's not like you are or you are not. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, uh, well, I used to, you know, eat food polluted by idols, but now I don't anymore. Oh, okay, we can accept that. Um, <clears throat> it's not such a clear dividing line. And they're all more linked to to living out your faith, isn't it? So you're not going to go and sit with people who are worshipping idols, idols and eat the food with them. You're not going to go and be immoral because of your faith in God right. and your, your obedience to God. So it's more linked. Circumcision, on the other hand, I suppose is, is, a, is a traditional act, I suppose, yeah. that just sets you apart, not necessarily... Like those ones. So two important things here. So so he shifted the the, the, the discussion from doctrine mm. to life. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, yeah. let's focus on yeah. the faithful life. Yeah. Let's focus on how you really live your life rather mm. than making the doctrine the issue. Mm. And so often this happens when when disputes arise, is that because everyone everybody wants to be right. Mm. And doctrine is, it's easier to say I'm right about doctrine mm. than to say I'm right about my life. Yeah. Mm. Because yes. when it's about your life, yeah. it's like, you know, okay, hang on. Yeah. The <laughs> Let me not pick up the first stone here because I'm going to get some stones coming back at me. So yeah. it, it almost pushes us into a position of humility and it's like, you know, okay, hang on. Now, now it's about me, not just about some some intellectual topic that we have a dispute about. So he shifted it from doctrine to life and said, this is what really, what it's really about is how we live our lives. The other thing, why does he mention the law of Moses? And you just touched on it. He says, for the law of Moses has been preached in all the cities and it's read in the synagogues and every Sabbath. Why is he saying this? Why is he bringing these things into, now think back to the two cultures that we have here. In a pagan city, what was the culture? What would the culture have been like? In a city like Antioch. Does anybody know a bit about that Roman no, Greek culture? Well, yeah, there would be lots of temples. Lots mm-hmm. of temples. Lots of sacrifices. Lots of sacrifices. Um, different sexual sort of, morality. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. High sexual immorality, temple prostitutes. Yeah. Yeah. The opposite yeah. of this. Yeah. The opposite of Jerusalem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A different kind of temple. <laughs> So, and, and what's the law of Moses say about clean and unclean, and how the Jews are associated? Are you allowed to, who are you allowed to associate with? You say, sit down with. Yeah. Only the clean. The clean. Only the clean. Mm. So the problem that the Jews had is that every Sunday you hear, be pure, be clean, and don't, you cannot sit down and eat with someone who was sexually immoral. Mm-hmm. You cannot sit down and eat with someone who just had uh, um, not kosher food. Mm-hmm. So James also shifted not only from life, but he said, you know, what's the real issue here? The issue is unity in the church. And let's focus on the things that will allow the Jews and the Gentiles to have communion together. Mm-hmm. And for the Jews, if they know that, oh, okay, these guys... They didn't go to the Greek temple yesterday. They didn't eat of any of that food. They abstained from sexual immorality and from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. It's like, okay, we can have a communion meal together. Mm-hmm. So he shifted the whole focus from doctrine to not only life, but also life together in the church. Mm-hmm. He said, let's think about the things that separate us and see if we can deal with that and say, can we have a communal meal together? Can we sit down and have communion and be united and unified as a church? Mm-hmm. And that is why he switched the focus and why he said, okay, let's make these rules. Let's send them these rules. And we, as we carry on, we're not going to read all of it. They actually agreed on that and they said, okay, let's send them this letter. And they did that. They sent them the letter. And the letter was delivered. And in verse uh, 30, We read that, so the men were sent off and they went down to Antioch where they gathered the church together and they delivered the letter. The people read it 
and they were glad for its encouraging message. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the Gentiles found this message encouraging? Well, they didn't have to get circumcised. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Don't have to get circumcised. We got that out of the way. My baptism is valid. I'm still saved. So, yeah. yes. I think they felt understood. They felt understood. Yeah, no, that's so important. I think they 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 realised that there was going to be unity. Mm. I think really yeah. that they were accepted. Yeah. In their in their beliefs mm. and things like that, right. they were accepted as part of. The community, the community. Yeah. right? And why did they not find it as a burden to be told, oh, don't, have sex, don't commit sexual immorality, don't eat uh, food sacrificed to idols? It's, it's kind of common sense, and it's, it's giving authority to things they probably didn't want to do anyway. Exactly. If they were converted to become yeah. Christians, yeah. they probably yeah. gave that up already. Yeah. 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 So it's like, yeah. 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 oh, okay, well... Mm. I'm not doing that anyway, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy about that. <laughs> That's easy, I can do that. Yeah. I mean, I stopped doing that when I became a Christian, so I just keep on stop doing it. <laughs> I think this was actually like a relief, you know, like confirming their new identity. Yeah, it's a confirmation. It's like, ah, okay. Yeah. No, I'm okay. I'm, I'm still saved. I'm in the grace of God. It, yep. It's very interesting, because in verse 10, it's like the yoke. Mm -hmm. And the and you were being yoked with this hard stuff. Yeah. This all is like the yoke is easy and the burden is light. Exactly. Yeah. What Jesus was saying back yeah. in, uh, in the gospels. So. Yes, yeah. Uh, the reason. So I'm reading the message version of the Bible, and when, after you, you read the stuff with the letter coming in, they say here. Then it was time to go home. They were sent on by their new friend with laughter and embraces. Mm -hmm. All around to report back to those who had sent them. So all this good news is like, oh, right. we leave them, be pleased, and now everyone was, woohoo, let yeah. me give you a hug and mm -hmm. whoo. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they left off. Mm. Everybody was, it was not like, mm, okay, fine, okay, we'll, we'll yeah. agree to disagree, we'll agree mm. that, okay, that's the way. Like, okay, yeah, that's a good solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. I, I love the message. Uh, <laughs> the message translation. It's, it's, uh, I wouldn't base any major doctrine on it, but, <laughs> but it makes the Bible yeah. come alive, uh, in application especially. Mm -hmm. So, what can we learn from our, from our personal lives, do you think, from this whole approach and from, from what, what, the way they address this in the, in the church in, in the Antioch and Jerusalem? Any thoughts? I think sometimes you can be uncertain about something you don't ask about it. So I think it's this is where I was to say, you know, ask about it because the answer may not be as bad as I think. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think to be open minded, you know, that we don't know everything, we don't have all the answers, but we can still learn and grow, you know, we shouldn't stagnate and think we have arrived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think for myself, I think like, um, like in being right and wrong is not only about the teaching. I, I love teaching. For me, it's like in, I really love doctrine to make, love sound doctrine. But then it's like, in, hang on, your life is really matters to God as well. They're both important. Yeah. Doctrine is a salvation issue. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it can be a distraction as well. And then it's like, hang on, this is, this is about how do I live my life? That's mm -hmm. really what, what yeah. unites us more than the doctrine, yeah. um, is, is sharing a common life together. I mean, how often do we talk about doctrine in, in, in church? You know? It's not like we, oh, you know, we share our lives more than we share about mm -hmm. doctrine. It's like, yeah, doctrine, okay, we agree on that, <clears throat> but it's like sharing our lives. That's what really is what brings us together, what keeps us together. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the fellowship we have. It is rooted in Christ, it's rooted in doctrine, but it's rooted in sharing a common lifestyle, a common mm. way of life, and agreeing on boundaries where, yes, we all agree that this is the way we live our lives, and, um, and, and that we can have communion meals together. Yeah. So as, we have, uh, as we're going to have communion now, um, let's reflect on, on some thoughts of gratitude about the barriers that were broken down by Christ so that uh, an Englishman and a South African 
and a dark skin and a light skin and an in-between skin and a blonde and a dark hair and a, and a uh, African speaker and an English speaker and a Romanian speaker and, and we can carry on and on and on um, can have a, a meal of unity. Uh, let's thank Christ for that and, and uh, it's possible because of Christ dying on the cross and, and uniting us all and forgiving us so that we can become part of the church. Let's pray for the day.